my dears, welcome to one of the longest research videos, if not the longest research video that I've ever done in the sense of like, I did a lot of researching for it. I don't know how long the runtime is going to be. It might be more or less than my eugenics video. I think that's my longest thus far. I'm not sure about that. I read a 400 page book and then I read a 200 page book and then I read a bunch of articles and I also watched like five documentaries. And honestly, I still feel like I haven't uncovered everything that there is to uncover in this topic. But I also know that I like, I simply don't have time or or the resources to dig further into this topic. So for now, we're just gonna leave it at this. Also, this is still a metric ton of information. So I think we're good. We're, we're just, I'm gonna close this chapter. I'm gonna be okay with how much I've learned and how there's stuff I haven't learned. And we're, we're just gonna move on. A few disclaimers before we begin. First of all, disability history was not a really good time for anybody involved. We will be touching on some topics of institutionalization, exploitation, slavery, eugenics, all that good stuff. I intend to like lightly poke them and then move away. Um, but you know, heads up, content warnings, always a good thing. Um, also like the history of freak shows wasn't as horrible. This is gonna sound bad. It wasn't as horrible as I thought it was gonna be. It's not great, but it's not horribly, horribly terrible. Um, we'll be focusing specifically on the American freak show in this video because most of the research in this field is on the American freak show. Um, please know that they very much existed all over Europe of American freak shows toward Europe all the time. Um, and also they definitely existed on other continents as well on some level because human curiosity is a thing. Um, also image description for friends who need it. Hi, I'm a white person in their early 20s with curly blondish brownish hair, thin a ponytail. There's a cream colored bow on top. I'm wearing a navy blue blouse thing and clear round glasses and I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf. So yeah. Also, if you don't know who I am, hi, my name is Sydney. My pronouns are they them. I study disability theater history and also like disability theater present uh, for my thesis. And this is part of that. I'm glad to have you um, in a lot of discussions in the history of theater generally that I've found myself in freak shows for some reason never really came up. And that always weirded me out because like, it feels like they were definitely a big part of American theater history, but everybody seems to pretend that they didn't exist probably out of shame or whatever, kind of in the same way that people just like pretend that blackface minstrelsy didn't exist, even though it like influenced today's popular culture like crazy. So yeah, but I did some research and I discovered that not only have freak shows shaped our current culture, but freak shows are also, our show, are also still alive and well in their own ways today. My speech impediment is really coming out in this video and I think I'm just gonna leave it in because I think that that's fun and representation is good. And I don't feel like editing how long this is gonna be. Anyway, uh, as a disabled actor and performer, this felt like finding my ancestors as well. And that was really powerful for me and it meant a lot. Um, so we're gonna talk about what freak shows are, um, what a freak is, how a freak is created, um, what they looked like, um, the history of freak shows, the current day of freak shows, and then a whole discussion of the ethics of them, which are way more blurry and confusing than I, I thought that they were going to be when we were going into this. So with that, please keep all of your limbs inside the vehicle at all times, however many limbs you may have. I do not care. All limbs are welcome. And welcome to the world of the American freak show. <laughs> so the first thing to tackle here is what is freakishness and how how does somebody in freak, how is somebody made into a freak? And also in case you cannot tell, we're going to be using that word a lot in this video. I know that in today's Today's. In today's vernacular, we do process the word freak as like one or two shades below a slur and has a bit of a gut punch feeling every time that we hear it. And I don't like saying it personally. Um, in this field, it is called a freak show because that's what the media referred to them at the time, despite them usually referring to themselves as sideshows. Um, and it is directly related to the theory of infreakment, which we're gonna be talking about in like a hot second. So I am gonna be using the word freak regularly. I promise that like over time you do kind of get used to it. Um, the first page of my notes had like the word freak in quotation marks and I avoided using it for a long while because it made me uncomfy. But like by page seven of my notes, like seven to 20, the more I learned about it, the more it just kind of slips into a gray area of somewhat pride and you, you just get used to it. So I know that it might feel weird, but I promise that like by the end of the video, it'll feel less bad. And also I'm not saying this because I like saying the word freak a lot. It's because I'm mimicking the field as it is, if that makes sense. And the field is run by disabled people. So it's not just like random able-bodied people being like, we like the word freak. It's like, yeah, anyway, I'm going to stop going off on various tangents and we're going to talk about the real thing. Who is a freak? Who's declared a freak? Why do we consider them freaks? Let's start with a quote by Rosemary Garland Thompson. The freak, in other words, is the projection of what culture fears most about itself. Basically, freaks, they're the outgroup, the ones who don't fit into norms based on their appearance or behavior, be that physical disability or difference, intellectual disability, race, weight, if they had tattoos or piercings, if they were a contortionist or could do other body defying things based on traditional norms. Basically, these people defy the norms of what people think people should be or what should be allowed in society. And by calling them weird and odd and freakish, we can emphasize that they're not the norm and we can push them to the fringes of society so we don't have to intermingle with them or face the reality that their existence is 
is in existence and that they're changing and challenging social norms. Your traditional bra burning feminists, for example, were very much in freaked and freak related terms were often used to describe their behaviors and opinions because, well, they were actively trying to overthrow the patriarchy. We find that threatening and therefore we just decide to cope with that by judging them for being unnatural and odd and strange. And that makes us not want to associate with them because we don't want to be odd and strange freaks because we are like a hive mind and we want to be in the in group and it makes the outgroup lose their power. And the freak blurred the lines between what we classify as human and what we don't. It also blurred the lines between what public and private should be. It blurred the lines between singularity and multiplicity in the sense of conjoined twins. And it messes with our understanding of the human self, of our sexual identities, our physical identities, and our personal identities. And by doing so, freaks firmly show what the ideal should be anything other than these deviancies. And the kinds of freaks most popular at one time or another are also directly correlated to what people feared most of the time. Barnum made sure of that because this was his business and he was very good at it and it made him the most money. Basically, freaks literally embodied the gray areas, the confusions and the contradictions of humanity and the general natural world. And they still do to this day. And we call this infreakment, when they infreak themselves or we infreak them, if that makes sense. But something that I find very interesting about freak shows is that it wasn't just disabled people. It was literally every possible minority all in one big tent, basically. All that really mattered is that you could make a good story for yourself. For example, a perfectly able-bodied black person born and raised in New Jersey could suddenly become a missing genetic link found in the depths of Africa. There's racism. I, for I forgot to mention the racism in the content warning. There's a, there's a lot of racism. But anyway, um, somebody who is naturally six foot nine could come up with a cool story, add a couple inches to their height and call themselves a real storybook giant. Everybody was a bit of a fraud on some level. Everybody got new origins and new backstories and things were hyperbolized a bit to make them profit and to prevent people from trying to expose them as like fakers or whatever. Their talkers or also known as showmen would purposefully walk the line right between farce and playing it straight. Kind of sort of in the way that we talk about the tooth fairy around children because like once you're in on the joke you know what's going on you know and you don't want to ruin it for the other people. So they if somebody wanted to expose them as a fraud, they didn't really have grounds to stand on in their claims of fraud because it was clear that it was fraud. It also was very common practice to out and shamed gaffed freaks. And those were people who were pretending to be physically disabled freaks, which then made the non gaffed freaks like appear more legitimate, if that makes sense. So yes, on one level, somebody's freakishness was often based a lot on appearance, especially in the sense of disability, but without a good talker and a good story and a good gimmick, you really didn't have much to stand on. In the same way that if I said that I had, I don't know, a one-eyed parrot, that would be interesting. You'd probably want to see my one-eyed parrot, maybe. But if I said I had an exotic bird that lost an eye when I was saving it mid-jaguar attack in the rainforest of Panama, you would be way more interested in seeing my one-eyed bird. Disabled people, as I said earlier, were also not the only kinds of freaks. There are basically four kinds of freaks. The first is born freaks, which are typically people born with physical atypicalities. I would assume this category also included people of color. That was never explicitly mentioned in my textbooks, but they were also more focused on the disability aspects. Um, then either way, born freaks were the celebrities of the business, seen as the most popular and most powerful because they didn't have to rely as much on gimmick or talent in order to survive in the show. Um, then there were made freaks. This was often people with piercings and tattoos. We don't have time to get into the in-depths of how our views of tattoos today are still kind of negative and that directly relates to the fact that tattooed made freaks usually use stories in the sense of like, I went to a, an abandoned island and the savage people kidnapped me and they tried to eat me and I barely escaped with my life and I've been marked forever by these tattoos, which made people think of tattoos as representing a permanent state of being an outcast with a lack of social mobility and a lack of will and control as is shown by their non-consensual body violation, also often intertwined with ideas of race. Fascinating. Anyway, so the third type of freak is the novelty act freak. That's the sword swallowers and that stuff. And then gaffed freaks were the ones who were faking it. Nobody liked them. And also most big freak shows didn't hire them to begin with. So there's your hierarchy of freaks. Now, when it comes to what the actual freak show looked like, traditionally you would walk up to the show, um, which was usually either circus sideshow, which was like a separate tent to the side of the main circus or a dime museum, which came before the circuses. Um, circi? Circuses. I don't know. Dime museums. Yes. Um, they're a building with many things that included human oddities, typically in their own section of the building, but they also had lots of other stuff. We're going to get into that in a second. Um, outside you would find a bally, a small platform with a mini show that would consist of a handful of the freaks and a showman doing a whole like step right up speech that we like all know very well. Um, they often also use drums to garner attention to their speeches, hence the phrase drumming up business. That's where that comes from, if you were wondering. Um, and once they had a sufficient enough crowd, 
ticket selling would begin. And this was a whole show on its own. It was like a whole thing. Um, the showmen would basically talk about how fast the ticket sellers could go and like, oh, watch it, how fast they can go. And then they would just funnel people through as fast as they humanly could. And that way people wouldn't check how much change they were putting down, how much change they were getting. The interaction would happen so fast and the show would get way more money than they traditionally charged because they were just shoving people through. They also usually had plants in the crowd. Plants as in humans they put there, not as in like, plants, um, they would start the ticket buying line so that others would follow because psychology. I don't like Barnum, but he was really, really smart. Um, inside of the building or tent, depending on what show you went to, you were likely to see one of two setups. The first is pit style viewing. I don't know if you've seen The Greatest Showman, uh, but that is a great example of what pit style viewing typically looks like. And then the other option was platforms that you would walk between, kind of like an exposition sort of. And platform viewing made a lot more money because rather than a consistent, we have shows at this time, this time, and this time, we have a limited number of people that can fit in it. You could just kind of keep shuttling people through the exhibits nonstop and make a lot more money. Inside the sideshow, you could also pay extra money to go to the blow off room. That was a room that often had more um, lewd exhibits. Think of like people defying gender norms or stuff you can fill in the blanks. Um, also, sometimes they just had the headliner there so that they could get extra money out of you. And then you could buy photos of each freak for a price and for a little bit more, get them autographed. Sideshows also changed their exhibits frequently so people would keep coming back over and over for more. Freaks would typically hop between museums and carnivals and circuses, often touring in the warmer months and then bouncing between permanent exhibitions in the winter time because that was easier. These kinds of freak shows, the ones that we typically think like Freak Show and Vaudeville did not exist in that kind of structure until the mid 1800s, but that also does not mean that the public showing of physically different people for profit did not exist until then because that is not the case. In ancient Egypt, it was very common practice to have dwarfs in royal households as comedic relief and entertainment. And many 1600s to 1800 European courts had dwarfs and fools who either feigned mental disability for entertainment or actually had mental disability. And it was also common for them to be servants. In the middle ages, it was pretty common to display people for money at fairs and on market days. And many peasant parents would tour the country displaying their disabled children for money. During this time, disabled people were considered monsters, a sign of God's wrath and satanic evil and all that stuff. And monsters were also shown for money at inns on the streets and in private homes. So you can think of that kind of as like freelance and freak I guess. Um, and in the mid 1500s, we saw a rise of cabinets of curiosity, which were rooms full of interesting things usually related to natural history, such as religious historical relics, those kinds of things, um, geological specimens, fossils, things like that. And they were usually existed. They were usually existed. They usually existed in collections in the private homes of rich and elite, but some people also would open their collections up for public viewing. These are the earliest versions of museums that ever existed. Around the 1720s and 30s, when imperialism was just beginning to have a little moment and secularism was growing, monsters became seen more as scientific oddities rather than signs of God's wrath, leading to a connotation that people who went to monster shows were gullible and ignorant and barbarous. So basically, rather than a religious experience, seeing monsters meant participating in grotesque low comedy only suitable for vulgar street plays. Because as we mentioned earlier, if something makes us uncomfortable because it challenges social norms, we just declare it undesirable and weird to cope with it. Good times. But then we saw the rise of industrialism and capitalism in the early 1800s as a result and kind of sort of part of the industrial revolution. And this is a time when immigration is increasing, secularization is increasing, people are fighting for women's rights. Darwin published his book on the theory of evolution, which kicked off a lot of things. We kicked off social Darwinism, segregation, nativism, eugenics, all that good stuff. There was a five of unrest in the US kind of growing, which would eventually become the US Civil War. Imperialism and Western expansion were in full swing. And along with the rise of industrialism, we saw an emphasis on conformity with the widespread use of clocks, department stores, ready-made clothing, factory items, and also photographs, which were making identity all about how you appeared on the outside because everybody was getting photographs of themselves. And there became an increasing market for amusements as people had more free time to film. Since things were changing so rapidly, there was a lot of anxiety around those changes and social norms were so different. And they also like needed to be followed at the same time, but they were ever changing. So people really looked to external sources in order to help them to understand where they fit and how they should be in order to make sure that they did fit in. Kind of in the same way that like, I watch commentary videos where people complain about the behavior of other people in order to teach myself to like, to mold myself in such a way that it doesn't accidentally become those things because nobody gives any directions on how you human. So I watch reviews of people to learn how to human, but like on a bigger scale. Um, freak shows also gave a strong sense of this is normal and this is not normal. And so you could be sure that you were able to fit into the normal. And since the exhibits were often marketed in the context of Darwin and labeled as scientific and in one place rather than traditional carnivalesque craziness, street performers all over the place, they felt very controllable and safe for people to want to go to. Something is rattling over here and it's kind of driving me a little up the wall. Shh. Anyway, 
How do traditional small street shows become these institutionalized freak show exhibitions? Enter Phineas Taylor Barnum and the 50-year golden age of the American freak show as well as the creation of consumer culture. Barnum joined the scene in 1835 with a purchase and exhibition of a blind and almost completely paralyzed enslaved woman named Joyce Heff. She performed supposedly of her own volition, but also she was a slave bought illegally by Barnum because slavery wasn't legal where he bought her, but he bought her anyway, um, as having been George Washington's nursemaid and purportedly 161 years old. When she died a year later, an autopsy was performed, live in front of a paying crowd as he do, and it turned out that she was probably only about 80 years old, but that garnered a lot of attention for him, and he knew how to play with that in order to gain popularity and fame and spark interest. Barnum published an autobiography like seven times and everybody just kept buying it. He was a, he was a guy. Um, now in 1841, he purchased a failing museum in downtown New York, a building mostly made of cabinets of curiosities, and then he turned that into his museum, upgrading and redoing many sections of it so that it became a combination zoo, cabinet of curiosities, theater, freak show, lecture hall, and museum. Also, they had pretty baby contests and modern appliances to show off and blackface minstrel shows and magicians and trained animals and a lot of things going on. Like there, there was, there was just so much going on, but this was effectively the first time that something, anything like this had been done. And it was a major hit for the populace because you could see everything in one place. Barnum knew how to be charismatic and how to attract a crowd. And he began marketing his museum as bona fide science. These freaks were the missing links Darwin was talking about. Come see for yourselves. Or this is a strange physical curiosity not yet explained. Do you have an explanation? Or this person is from the lands we're conquering out West. Come learn how they live. And he would play with all of that and all of the human interest in order to get more people shuttling through the doors and paying money to get into his museum. Also, it was quite affordable for everybody who wanted to come. They were called dime museums for a reason. I think the dime comes from children were a dime because adults were usually 25 cents. Um, I could be wrong about that, but they were cheap. And this was the first time that science was really taken out of the like fancy snobby academic white men setting and taken and like handed over for people to see for themselves and to learn for themselves and also pay money to get souvenirs and tell their friends about their amazing time at Barnum's Museum so that they would all come back. And at its peak, the museum typically had about 15,000 visitors a day. Also, Barnum would hold special showings for medical professionals and scientists to sketch and write about his freaks. And then he would use their writings and reviews and sketches and fancy scientific wording to legitimate his own exhibits because of the fancy like, oh, these are approved by science people. So they're Real science. And I'm also realizing that this sounds like I admire Barnum. Let me remind you that he was a very terrible guy and also anybody who's known as the father of modern consumer culture is automatically somebody I would love to punch in the face. But like in the sense of economics and business and like people, he was a very, very smart guy and he did completely change our society as we know it today. But he did suck. He, he, did, he did suck. So I just want to make that clear. I don't like this man, but he's interesting. Yeah, that makes sense, maybe. So a year after he opened his museum and it was a big success, he signed a four-year-old dwarf by the name of Charles Stratton to educate and train and tour the world with. You may know this child as General Tom Thumb. The boy quickly became a worldwide favorite and Barnum's popularity absolutely soared. Stratton was trained in professional acting and he did shows that often had sets in miniature and everybody found him adorable and incredibly charming and yeah. Um, his story is fascinating. It's also very sad. He made millions and he claimed that he loved performing and he continued to perform when he was well enough off to retire several times over, but he began working in that business since the age of four. So I can't necessarily trust if he actually enjoyed doing performing or if he kind of told that to himself because like it's all that he knew. And so he saw those two things as the same thing. I don't know. But anyway, fascinating case study. Now's not the time for that because we have a lot of things to cover. So. Moving on. Now, after the Civil War, taste began to change. Barnum had opened several museums. Also, the original one in New York burnt down like several times. So in, uh, in 1868, he decided to focus his energy instead on traveling circuses, which would, in theory, burn down less. Uh, so during this time, the variety show became more institutionalized in American culture, and it led to a push to make it more family friendly because it was traveling a lot and kids wanted to go to the circus and all that stuff. So this meant the variety show increased their amounts of clowning and comedy and cuteness to counteract the more dark and lewd things. Many of the lewd acts were specifically moved to blow off tents rather than being in the main show to make it family friendly. So that's interesting. Um, also one of my favorite parts of Freak Show history, on Coney Island, there was an exhibit that was effectively a hospital for preterm babies. All of them were weighing around two to three pounds. And up until the opening of this hospital in 1896, preemies were seen as weaklings who weren't meant to survive because eugenics. And the technology to save them, which was basically just incubators, that technology had existed for a bit at this point, but it was just too expensive and took too much staffing to even be remotely hospital in traditional hospital settings. In nearly 50 years, the Coney Island Hospital was able to give 
save about 6,500 newborns a second chance at life, while also educating the public about preterm birth and care and combating eugenic notions. And while nobody is entirely sure if the head doctor guy who started it and ran it was actually technically a real medical doctor, the story is good and it brings me joy, so we're just gonna roll with it. Yeah. My other favorite part of freak show history is the 1899 revolt of the freaks, where a sideshow group touring Europe was just tired of being referred to as freaks. They didn't appreciate it. So they all teamed up. They created the first acting union because actors equity didn't start till 14 years after this. And they went on strike until the word freak was removed from their sign, from advertisements and from anything else written about their sideshow. They ended up voting to change the term to prodigies and they won. So. I think that's pretty great. Now, technically the golden age of the freak show lasted until the 1930s, but the freak show has never really died. It just continues to evolve and change to fit the fashions and the mindsets of the time. For example, as we saw in the early 1700s, tides turned again and suddenly freak shows were not seen as respectable or even remotely respectable anymore and increased scientific knowledge meant diagnostic labels for the conditions of the freaks and that led to people pathologizing them and being more concerned about their welfare, but not in like a they're humans and we should care about them as equals kind of way and more of like a they're poor sick people. That's so sad kind of way. Also some shy, 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 some shy, <laughs> some side shows we're able to pivot to making this pathologization interesting and intriguing to people and stay open for many more years, but a lot of them did begin to disperse into circuses, beauty pageants, zoos, film and photography, and vaudeville. Now, most sources that you're going to read are going to tell you that the 1940s and 50s were the death of the freak show. We will talk about why that is not really the case in just a bit, but the traditional 1840s Barnum version of the sideshow as we think of it when we think of it was beginning to disappear. The world wars made frivolous things, specifically those around disability, less fun for people simply because first of all, their soldiers were often coming home looking similar to the freaks in the freak shows. So that was the thing. Also civil rights things were beginning to move and shift, which led people to feel bad for these marginalized people. This is also the time period when the poster child was invented. So like, look at this starving child in Africa, come support our cause in which we and freak people in a different way to get money out of you, but it's different because it's for a good cause. And in fact, the rise of medicalization caused views of the freak to shift from an embodiment of wonder to an embodiment of error, something to be pitied and avoided rather than something to be celebrated. During this period, the medical model became the primary method of showing off oddities. We also saw a rise of TV and movies in this period, particularly horror films, which often filled that emotional experience of horror um, that was typically felt when attending freak shows. Um, and so that that was also much more socially acceptable than going to freak shows. So that kind of was a bit of a replacement. By the 1980s, there were only a few freak shows of the traditional sort left, and most of them were populated solely by made freaks rather than born freaks. And that brings us to today. Our immediate response to thinking about freak shows is condemnation and horror in the sense of like, how could humans ever do something so terrible? What is wrong with people? Um, and we kind of like to pretend that they never existed, which is why we don't see many conversations about this. Or when we do, it's the greatest showman and it's completely glorifying it. But here's the deal. First of all, recent research is showing that not only are freak shows alive and well in their own forms, but they also show basic human longing and desires. And there will always be something similar in its place culturally, no matter how hard we try to rid ourselves of them. I'm looking at you, inspiration porn disability videos. Second of all, this is a huge portion of theater history in our country and in the wider world. So much of what we do on stage and how stages are set up and how general consumer culture is set up, also how disabled people are viewed by the general public are direct results of the early American freak show and its many, many iterations. And to pretend that these never existed is frankly unfortunate because it's so crucial to how we live today. But I'm gonna get off my soapbox for a bit. We're gonna talk about ethics in a little in a little while. We're getting there. That's a later problem. I will say that there are a handful of traditional freak shows that are still running today. Most of them are touring companies, um, but there is, as far as I know, still one open daily institutionalized um, on Coney Island. It was open in the early 2000s. I think it's still open. Um, it is a solid mix of made and born freaks and the majority of the freaks working in these shows um, did ask to join. Um, we're going to talk about why somebody in this century might want to join a freak show in just a few minutes, but first we need to talk about what freak shows look like today and how they still very much exist. I think the first one we got to touch on is Ripley's Believe It or Not, because in the middle of doing research for this video, um, I visited San Francisco and I saw one of them just like on the street. And I saw this like freak show wording that I was so used to reading my textbooks. And my brain exploded a bit because obviously this is like, this is a freak show. So I did some research, learned that their first museum opened as an auditorium in the, um, at the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, followed by trailer shows across the country. And then they opened dozens of locations around the world. Um, from what I can tell, it 
It seems similar in the way to Barnum's original museum was a modernized form of cabinets of curiosities as well as like theaters and arcades. And they also have aquariums and wax museums and amusement rides. Other than human curiosity, so I would assume that they do on some level have a little bit because like Guinness World Record style human oddities are a thing. And I believe that Ripley's is kind of related to that. It does very much feel like a modernized American museum, which is fascinating to me because I've always heard of Ripley's Believe It or Not and seen their books and whatever and thought about them as something cheap and gimmicky and aimed at the gullible, especially children. And and that I think that children would be better spent learning things at more educational museums that make interesting things fun in a different way. And then the day after that, uh, after reflecting on all of this, I went to the California Academy of Sciences, which is absolutely incredible, by the way. If you're in the Bay Area, I cannot recommend it enough. It's kind of pricey, but like it's it's worth it. It's a zoo, aquarium, science museum, planetarium, children's museum sort of moment. The food's also really good. Um, there's a lot more emphasis, obviously, on sciences. And I had a really awesome time and I learned a lot. But like with this freak show context in my mind, I very much felt different about everything and I paid attention to how it was marketed and how it was structured and how I perceived things and judged things going into the situation. So maybe one day I'll have to go to Ripley's and I'll have to learn more. I'll let you know. Um, but also they don't follow the actual museum code of ethics and they're the reason why the Marilyn Monroe dress debacle happened. So I don't really want to give them my money. Um, but I would love to hear your opinions on this because it's very obviously a dissemination of the freak show and I'm fascinated that culturally it has lasted this long. I'm, I'm interested in how it's this well-funded still to this day. But anyway, moving on from that tangent, in society our so-called self-made freaks, our people we look upon with pity and awe and fascination and repulsion and moral judgment are typically fat people and bodybuilders. Um, we also practice so much infrequent on those who are in the popular eye. We look to see what's weird about celebrities. We wanna see them as almost inhuman objects. Popularity in our culture always equals infrequent on some level. I read a chapter about Michael Jackson and how he embodies infrequent and also how he was like obsessed with the elephant man, which I think is really interesting. We're not gonna talk about that today because I don't like Michael Jackson. We also have reality TV and talk shows and also my left foot is so numb right now. Reality TV and talk shows are environments where dysfunctional human beings parade themselves in front of an audience and they're about people on display and the public examination of what are essentially private affairs. Because if you think about it, there's a traditional showman, usually the host, who guides you from exhibit to exhibit, adding their takes and explaining the stories of said exhibit, which is just as important as the infreaked person on their own. And since it's no longer really respectable to infreak people with physical atypicalities, though little people, big world does still very much exist, so there's that. Thanks TLC. We instead focus on psychological freakishness. I'm talking about my strange addiction, my 600 pound life. Um, every reality dating show, Dr. Phil, frankly, most talk shows that interview celebrities even. And a crucial part of freak shows was how they made the wider public feel better about their own lot in life because, well, at least they're not this freak. And we kind of continue to do that with the media that we consume today. It's just packaged just slightly differently. And much like the traditional freak show, many times the most sensational aspects are slightly played down, but very much acknowledged, but they just like pretend that we're not acknowledging them. And the educational and scientific aspects are played up in order to legitimize that spectacle. What I find most interesting about reality TV as a form of freak show is the element of performance. We all know cognitively on some level that what we see is sort of performance on reality TV. We know it's highly edited. We know that it's not totally real. We know that producers tell them what to do. And yet the line between character and human is still super blurry to us. And we're never really sure what is performance and what isn't. And for example, if you lived in a tiny town in the middle of nowhere, and the only exposure to people of color you saw was those who were on Dr. Phil, you're likely gonna forget that that's performance. And you'd be way more excited seeing something you've never seen before, so you'd watch them more and then unconsciously begin to assume that every person of color is like the ones that you saw on Dr. Phil, which is obviously a big issue. And it's kind of in the same way that people assumed disabled people weren't performing. This is just precisely how and who they were in real life and then saw every disabled person through this freak show lens. And we still kind of do today. There's not much difference between how they were dealt with in the 1800s and how we're dealt with now. Another interesting case study of the modern freak show is the existence of medical documentaries, which I watched several of for this video um, and watching them through a new lens was really trippy. Basically in these situations, the freaks are no longer prodigies. They're cold, hard medical cases. And they're often used as central to the story. The story is about them, but then in reality, the story wouldn't change at all, no matter what person you put in that position because they're solely just a body used as a catalyst to show the medicalized view of technology. And it really emphasizes the scientific legitimization and often brings into questions of ethics in the story but they're almost last minutely thrown in and they're usually in a tone that focuses more on speculation about the lives of the freaks than like an actual ethical discussion of medical stuff. Conjoined twin documentaries, for example, are extremely guilty of this. There was also one I watched that was super white savory, which I really hated. I'm gonna link both of them in the description for you if you want to watch them through that lens as well. I thought it was really interesting. I also knew that I was like falling prey to freak show analysis stuff, but 
you know, <laughs> you know, it just, it happens. I found it very eye-opening into how we treat the humanity of people and how we see our, how, and how we seem to just be cool removing humanity of things when we call it science and we're like, humans don't exist anymore. It's scientific. And that's really bizarre. And that brings us to the most important discussion of the whole video, the ethics of all of this. When I started researching the American Freak Show, I assumed that they were unequivocally all bad. They should not have happened. They took advantage of people. And I feel gross thinking about them. But just a few hundred pages into research, I started to realize that no, it's way more of a gray area than I could have ever anticipated. So I kept doing research, trying to iron out all my confusion and come up with a solid thesis. And all I did was confuse myself further and get even more information. And so we're going to go over some of the main things I came across in my thought process. And you can tell me how you feel and what you think, because my brain's confused. So you're going to be confused too. Welcome. The first thing that we need to address here is that humans are gonna human freak shows are always going to exist in one way or another we will often pretend that we're not interested in it i for one only watch reality tv when it's an educational analysis of reality tv so it feels productive but i'm still engaging with freak show content in my own way i also did watch a season of the bachelor once and i didn't i didn't totally hate it but i felt like ethically bad but i enjoyed it anyway yeah, this kind of stuff is always going to stick around, no matter how much we try to pretend that we are above it and we are better people than that and whatever. And a world without some level of infrequent is virtually impossible. And we just need to accept that. And we need to keep that in mind as we're engaging with the world. There's also the whole argument of high art versus low art. Humans can pretend to like only so-called high art, but like no matter how much you love Shakespeare, we all stoop for a fart joke. Don't even pretend that you don't. Low art is always going to be the most popular form of art. We've seen that over and over again in history. It just goes in and out of fashion as people find it respectable or not, because humans are weird and we have hive minds and I hate it. But anyway, let's talk about the positives of freak shows. But like, Positives with nuance, you know? A major positive is the resistance of it all. Freak pride was and is to this day real and transforming universal hate toward them as pride of being part of their own unique group is a fundamental act of resistance and it's super freaking powerful. They understood their value and their importance and they said, sure, we might be freaks, but we are proud of being different and we matter too, which is frankly, what the disability movement continues to fight for. To quote Eli Clare, I relish the knowledge that there have been people who have taken advantage of white people's and non-disabled people's urge to gawk. I love that disabled people at one time were paid to flaunt and exaggerate their disabilities. And frankly, not just at one time, we still are. And there's just something so incredible about that. The fact that they just took the discomfort people feel around disability and decided to exploit it for profit, like profit that went directly to the disabled people. That's awesome. Like that, I don't, I don't want to describe it as punk rock, but like, I don't know. It's, I think that's really cool. And what I also think is really cool is that they knew that the industry relied on their continuous performance. And in 1899, with the revolt of the freaks, they proved that fact by asking for what they deserved and they actually won it. And that's oddly inspiring to me that disabled people in the 1800s were fighting for their rights. Even today, many people who work or have worked in freak shows still hold a lot of pride in calling themselves freaks because by accepting this thing that everybody says is fundamentally wrong with you, they're fundamentally changing how disability is viewed and how stigma is applied. And that brings me so much joy. And also Freaks and Sideshows found so much community. The golden age of the freak show was also the exact same time that there was a rise of institutionalization and ugly laws, meaning that most physically disabled people were sort of hiding from the world in order to protect themselves and not get institutionalized. And the freak show was one of very few places where they could congregate and find people like them and find that community that they couldn't get anywhere else. They were also afforded an autonomy that they couldn't get in mainstream society. They got to work, they got to make money, and they got to live effectively on their own, albeit within a troop. But they were basically on their own and they all supported each other with accessibility needs, which is really cool. And they found acceptance and freedom within the freak show that they wouldn't have gotten anywhere else. Also, the pay was kind of awesome. Like even today, if I were to go to Coney Island right now and join their freak show, I would make a starting wage of about a thousand dollars a week. It's hard work. It's like really long, grueling days. And to quote one of the documentaries I watched, you kind of sell your soul for it, but it is good money and that cannot be denied. And according to a lot of sources, freak shows were no more schmoozy and dirty than regular show business. I mean, sure there's drugs and sex work and violence and all of those things, but that's not any different than historically the rest of show business. So there's that. The documentaries that I watched, which were stunning and amazing, by the way, I highly, 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 highly recommend them. I've linked them all in the description for you. Had a lot of extant clips of what freak shows look like today. Um, and I tried to watch them whilst like suspending my modern judgment of this type of performance because it is a history of performance. And what I discovered is that everybody in that room seemed so uncomfortable, like the, the energy, 
just from what I could see on screen in the room just didn't look good. Disabled people often just showed off things uh, like how they could do simple and regular basic things that and that made me feel strange but also I felt over and over again like I know personally this is a character that they're putting on for a show but how much of this is a character and how much isn't and do people in the audience understand that and do they understand the transgression that the show was doing or are they just seeing it as face value and judging all disabled people based on this one performance and the whole existential crisis made it kind of impossible for me to sit back and enjoy the show because I was so lost in everything else to just enjoy it. And it felt almost like when shows reclaim old offensive things as new things with different contexts, but then old white people come and see the show. And then you wonder if maybe they walked out thinking that maybe offensive things like blackface are actually okay again. And that makes you a little nervous the whole time as you're trying to enjoy it, if that makes sense. Like, I think a traditional freak show with an all disabled audience would be super transgressive and super powerful and super, super cool. And I think that a traditional freak show in Coney Island bringing in anybody off the street to see it without understanding the nuances of that is just kind of perpetuating old stereotypes, if that makes any sense. And this all made me wonder, freaks consider themselves to be actors, but if they were just showing off their daily survival skills in their act and otherwise acting pretty much like themselves, like, I want to support them, but how much is that actually acting? Like, could they or even should they be considered actors? Obviously, some of them did put on full shows, but others just kind of did what they normally would do. And the next and most important thing is consent. So many of the readings talked about how freaks continued performing after their contracts were done or consented to perform from the beginning. But looking at their circumstances and their wider context, like, what other choices did they have? Is this really consent? Especially because many of them were signed into these shows before they could walk or talk. So how could they really consent to this? And by the time that they could consent to it, did they really have any other choice or know anything different than those shows to even try to seek the wider world? Like, I feel like as a disabled person, a lot of disability is the oppression of unwanted attention, whether that's from kids staring at you on the street or doctors poking and prodding you over and over and over again at weekly doctor's appointments, or your employer telling you that you don't seem disabled. It's completely rampant. And honestly, if I could exist in a society and do things that I was already doing and just get paid for it, I, I wouldn't be too mad about that. So like, there's also that to reflect upon because like, as a medical enigma, I'm often asked a billion questions and I often don't mind answering those questions because they make me reflect upon myself and also remind me what makes me cool, what makes me interesting. I am an interesting human being. I would rather have people ask those things and know and then move on rather than wonder forever and not focus on just like being friends and seeing us as equal humans, if that makes any sense. And like some days I do feel very gross and objectified and like I just want to go a while without talking to anybody, but most of the time I'm fine with it. So like. I'm basically in freaking myself. I'm in freaked in the situation and I don't really gain anything from it. And to quote Robert Wildlow, who's the tallest person in recorded history, who worked the freak circuit for quite a while, is recorded as saying, I am more concerned about how physicians would present me than I am by my treatment at the hands of any showman. So basically he's gonna do the same thing in a freak show as he would in a doctor's office. Why not do it in a place where he can be seen as cool rather than medically odd and actually gets paid and taken care of. And I totally see where he's coming from on this. Like. That makes total sense to me. Effectively the internet right now, you guys are, I'm being paid to unfreak myself, sort of, but I'm also putting on an act. It's really trippy. But again, as I was saying with consent earlier, this in this situation, that was just picking the lesser of two evils. That's not technically full free will. It's not free will unless they have a significant range of meaningful choices. They have occasions for those meaningful choices, mental and physical capacity and security. They have those things to evaluate those choices. They have sufficient time to evaluate their choices and they have full information about all of their choices. And I don't think that in the case of freak shows, that was really the case for anybody involved because if your choices are death, institutionalization or freak show, which one are you going to choose? And also like how much of their seeming joy in performing is just making light of a bad situation. And when people interview them about it, they said they were having a good time because that's like their only choice and they were under contract, you know, like were they fully informed of all the potential consequences of their courses of action or were they simply apathetic and people saw that as voluntarily? And also most importantly, if an individual consents by virtue of what appear to be acts of free choice to being degraded, exploited or oppressed, does that act of consent end the moral problem that his or her situation seems to constitute? And to quote another one of my texts, the choice is so bad, I don't even care if it's voluntary. But then again, who are we to sit here at major distance from the freak show to say what people should or should not do? That truck should shut up though. One of my readings compared this to how feminist theorists sit and talk on and on and on about whether sex work should exist, whether erotic dancing should exist, whether 
Corn. I don't want to get demonetized. This is a lot of work. Corn should exist without thinking about the fact that while we may never understand why somebody might find joy in something, it's also not our place to tell them what they can and cannot do in order to find equality and freedom because when it comes down to it, equality and freedom means being able to do whatever the heck you want to do. And frankly, if we have to put down something important and try to forcefully get rid of something that has been around for thousands and thousands of years, we will never be fully successful as a movement. Outright condemnation of freak shows is not empowering and freeing people, it's further limiting them. It's a small group of people, but still we're not including them in our movement. And there are many examples of that, particularly the disability advocate who made it illegal for side shows to exist in one state, which then made a performer that they never asked before doing all of these legal things lose his job and livelihood. But then on the other side of the argument, we don't really have blackface minstrelsy anymore because it furthered a lot of stereotypes and it furthered a lot of damaging lies about minority people. And also that also makes complete and total sense. So I don't know where I stand on this. And it's something that I wanna reflect on further. It's something I wanna study further. And I think at the end of the day, it's not really my place to put judgment one way or another because it's not my life. It does impact my life as a minority person, but I don't know, it's so tricky. And like, what I think it's important is the understanding that freak shows are never gonna go away in their entirety. They show us difference and they show us deviance and they show us people getting away with that difference and deviance. And there's a natural human desire in there, either to see that deviance and be glad that, oh, I'm more normal than that, or to see yourself as the odd one out too and see them being proud of it. And I wonder how we could potentially channel this energy and this human desire into some sort of well thought out and well considered and healthy representation that fits the same desire profile if that makes sense at all. I think I'm just kind of rambling at this point. But another important thing is to remind ourselves that the body marked as disabled is ironically the one with the greatest potential for destabilizing the very systems of authority that so mark it. We've talked about this before when we talked about disability and capitalism. Disability and difference and freakishness are inherently dangerous to hierarchical systems of power. We are the opposite of conformity and you cannot control us. And no matter what you may feel or how you may feel about freak shows, there's something to be said about embracing your inner freakishness and also exploiting that for money. Um, <laughs> blatant and proud difference is liberatory for everyone, no matter what. With that, um, we covered a lot of ground today. I really hope that you learned something. I hope that you had a good time. I sure did. I would love to know your thoughts about any of all of this in the comments because I've been studying this for like literally three months and this discussion has just been going on over and over and over in my brain and I would love to hear disabled people's or even not disabled people's opinions on this as well. I will include all of my resources and some further exploration links in the description if you want to learn more. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over and I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.